Thank you. Welcome everyone to the second day and the second panel of the Animals in the po American Popular Imagination virtual conference organized by Pop Research. Um, this panel is titled Figuring Animals in Poetry. And today we have two speakers, Jenny Dubino and Christiana Pagliaruska, who will talk about um, different kind of kinds of poems. Uh, before we begin, I'm going to go through the instructions. Uh, this conference, this presentation will be recorded and later uploaded onto our YouTube channel. So if someone's not comfortable with that, uh, please do not turn on your cameras. We are going to have the presentations first and the session uh, for questions and answers at the end. Um, so also if you're not comfortable with um, showing your face on the screen or you don't have a microphone or a camera, you can type your questions on the chat and I will read them for you. And or you can also use the raise hand button that's uh, available through the Zoom tools um, before you um, ask your question. So without further ado, I'm going to present our first speaker, who's named Jeannie Dubino. She comes from Appalachian State University and her presentation for today is titled Roundup on Lethal Injection the war against weeds and street dogs. The floor is yours, Jeannie. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. I wish I could attend all of the conference, but I'm teaching pretty much during most of it. Well, let me share my screen and get started. So I really left out a significant part of the title that is the war against weeds and street dogs in modern and contemporary poetry. And of course, the poetry critiques the war against weeds and street dogs. So these are the poems that I am going to consider. This is a lot of poems. This is 17 poems by 16 poets. And I am obviously not going to be able to look at all of them. So I put them in the chat. If you can't find them online, I could try to send you a copy. But I'm looking at five sets of patterns. And so I will start with weeds and then for the second half look at street and stray dogs. And you can see that the categories somewhat line up, though not entirely. With weeds, I'll focus on gardens and look at how they don't belong. And with street dogs, vagrants who do not who should not be present in that space. The second category does differ. Weeds are shown as particularly hardy at the same time as vagrants. Whereas you'll see in the poems I'm looking at that street dogs are represented as vulnerable. Their coats are emphasized. I mean, we have a speaker often looking at the dog and describing it, reflecting on him, her, I should use pronouns. So the speakers tend to look at the dog's coats. The dogs are often injured. They're pregnant or fecund. They have, they, um, have just delivered. And then they're also represented as being killed or already dead. The final three categories line up with each other, representation of the self, and then representation of the self. And then they're also represented as agents in themselves, not just as an occasion to think about something else. And then finally, as part of a totality. So let me begin with a dog roll poem. I researched Paula, I could find out nothing about this poet, but I think I selected it and I want to start with it because this is a scene that's very familiar to anyone who lives in the US. Um, I think that people who are homeowners and who run apartment complexes and universities and campuses around the entire United States are in love with Roundup. And so I will read this first stanza to you. I saw a man with herbicide who sprayed the weeds until they died. It's stinging in my nostrils still, that chemical designed to kill. Kind of sums up what uh, the attitude against weeds in our country. And then the second stanza, as you can see, is, well, what if, what if, what if man were the weeds and God was the weed killer? What would happen then? And so anyway, pretty self-explanatory poem. But let me move on to um, the way weeds are represented in terms of their relationship to gardens. Now, Carol Rumens is the only non-US poet, but I'm featuring her because I saw this poem on a US very staunch US website and NPR website. And it's more about this uh, kind of dichotomy, if not war, between weeds and flowers. And so you can see that I, I'm going to really only look at the 
words that are um, highlighted in black. So you see that weeds are swarming, they're illegitimate versus the legitimate flowers. Weeds have roots like wire, they're crude, and often the roots of weeds get emphasized. They are survivors, they're persistent, they seem oblivious to any attempts to weed them out. They, they prevail against pesticides, which in fact that they, they do. So in the final stanza of this four stanza poem, the bottom stanza in the second column, we see that even though weeds are the unfavored, they persist. So why not try to love them? We try to smile. We learn to forgive them. And there's a kind of sardonic tone. And the we here is not necessarily the speaker who is you know, the poet herself, who is really kind of writing from the point of view of, of gardeners who would have only gardens filled with flowers and and vegetables. So the next category, scene setting, Robert Frost, great naturalist, American poet, who has written a number of poems about weeds. I will only look at two. But in this one, uh, we have a scene of late fall, early, actually early winter, where a few weeds and stubble are showing through the snow. We have a sense of desolation. And then in true pathetic fallacy, the poet projects his own um, loneliness onto the scene. The loneliness includes me unawares. We see in that final line in the first half of the poem. And then we see that in the final line of the second half of the poem, that, um, that this, these weeds really enhance that sense of desertion. And of course, Frost is such a brilliant poet. We have snow, we think of desert places. We also think of sand and desert. And the, just the one or two weeds really um, enhances that sense of desolation. And the next poem by Edna St. Vincent Millay, another great American poet who wrote in the first half of the 20th century. We have a speaker who positions herself in a field of white daisies and red sorrel. And the speaker is feeling isolated, if not damned. And she describes the weeds, that is the daisies and the sorrel um, in connection with herself. The daisies in the second stanza are sprung from damaged seeds. Um, and then this red fire, the red sorrel, is a worth of worthless crop of crimson weeds cursed. And so the speaker herself feels a curse. We sort of see images of fire, if not almost suggestive of hellfire. After all, one is damned to hell. And so the speaker kind of projects her own self as being kind of a bastard onto these weeds. And we see as she's lying in this field, the blood too bright, the brow, whoops, sorry about that, the brow too accursed. I'm trying to move the pictures so that I can read the poems here. And so this is definitely also a poem that is scene setting and that shows the weeds in terms of herself. And I just want to quote a line from a New York Times magazine from May 1st. And the quotation is, Humans are hypersocial animals. We're constantly looking for one another out there in the world. And that's about finding our double. And I like the fact that the speaker here finds her double in the weeds. Well, this poem is a very, some of you may be familiar with it, the weed, but the situation is of a speaker lying, um, imagining himself dead as a corpse. And while he's um, I, this is a dream poem where the speaker is imagining himself as a corpse. And what he envisions is that his this weed is growing through his, his heart. This slight young weed grows through his heart. That's about six lines down. And this is from a much longer poem, as you can see from the ellipses. Of course, the stem would grow thick on a weed. Weeds are often represented as having good, strong stems. And it breaks through his heart and it splits his heart in two, as you can see from the second line in the bottom, uh, from the bottom of the first half. And so the weed breaks through his heart, fluid sort of floods over the weed and almost sweeps it away. But of course, weeds are strong, they prevail, it struggles. 
and then it's standing still in the severed heart. It has broken his heart. What are you doing there? I asked. He's personifying the weed and the weed speaks back to him in this kind of gruesome poem. I grow, it said, but to divide your heart again. So even in death, weeds prevail. Uh, we can't even kill them when we are dead. And so anyway, a lot can be said here, but I will stop there. And then as far as weed as agent, this is so obvious in Marion Forster, uh, San Diego poet who writes in changes, this haiku, I will read it in its entirety. Defying logic, weeds push through the sidewalk cracks, which is how many of us encounter weeds, changing history. So weeds are not just agents in our own lives, they have global agency. I teach a class in global infrastructures. We spend a lot of time on weeds, how weeds um, at, you know, require us to constantly go to war if we want to kind of preserve that infrastructure. Here is another uh, poem about weeds as having great agency by one of the great weed poets, Theodore Rethke, renowned, renowned um, as a kind of greenhouse poet. He actually has a body of poems called the Greenhouse Poems. His father had a greenhouse. And so I'm not even looking at the poetic nature of these poems. I mean, here we have rhymed couplets. The poem is sardonic. Um, the poet address, the speaker um, apostrophizes the weeds, long live the weeds. Long, I'm thinking about long live the queen, long live the king. Um, but long live the weeds that overwhelm my narrow vegetable realm. And so we have this kind of struggle. Look at the fourth line from the bottom. I match my little wit. So the weed is sort of seems to be up here. The wit seems to be down there. And I earn the right to stand or sit. Um, these weeds shape the creature that is I. So again, we see this. Um, the incredible agency that the poet gives in terms of, or the speaker gives in terms of the power of weeds. And then finally, this is the final weed poem that I will discuss by Colleen J. McElroy, great American poet who has won many honors as have so many of the poets I'm looking at here. But we have more of this rhyme scheme and um, we see this real youthful energy, a lot of vitality. Look at the wholeness of this poem, sidewalks of webs and weeds. We have an ecosystem run parallel to empty lots where foul deeds that are foul is kind of uh, uh, obviously not, uh, not wholly intended, um, ironic. And we have these three girls, Irma Jean, Cora Jean, and I, three Debs. And the word Deb in the US is meant to, uh, it, it means a girl who is uh, moving from girlhood to womanhood. It's like La Quinciera. Um, and so these girls are kind of breaking, they're on this borderline. And there's a kind of sense of jubilation that they are playing in this world against the cracks of webs weeds and webs, and notice how Debs rhymes with webs. And so we have the scene of vitality of dance, et cetera, and so on. And the final two lines of the poem show that the first part of the poem has taken place in the past. And the speaker remembers this time as a time of fruit, fruitness, fruition, um, uh, fruitfulness, fruition, vitality. Now memories of dances are sprinkled, and let me see if I can move this, like seeds among cousins and sidewalks of webs and weeds. And so they're all part of this big picture. So I end the weeds um, on a positive note, and I will do that with the dogs as well. But now let me start with the first of the poems, which is um, by Kay Boyle, whose life, as you can see from her dates, spans almost the entirety of the 20th century. She was a political poet. She wrote as a political poet, she was certainly of age during the Vietnam War, a brutal war in which the US bombed not just Vietnam, but also Cambodia, Laos, and the war spilled over. And so she's looking at the impact of this war on the dogs and look at her address the dogs, another kind of apostrophizing poem where the dogs are um, get the central attention front and center. And so she addresses them, do not stab my heart like this. 
a lot of pathos in this poem, and that continues throughout the entire poem, The Lost Dogs of Phnom Penh. Scabby vagrants, you can already see how they're represented in terms of their skin. Dogs are often represented as scabby, and that's going to be apparent in the coming poems too. They're vagrants, garbage hounds, and they're waiting for the truck to sail in so that they can you know, get the garbage from the ship. And then in the final part of the poem, look at the third line from the bottom, we read, I think of you lost dogs of the eternal wishbone bones of your breast and think about the heart and think about the wishbone. I think about you, I'm honoring you, I'm grieving you. And the dogs become a kind of stand in as well for the Cambodians who are deeply affected by this war and for all dogs in general, street dogs. The next poem also features dogs on the street. This is a fairly famous poem by Elizabeth Bishop called Pink Dog. And for those of you who know this poem, it is set during carnival in Brazil, Elizabeth Bishop, great American poet. And she spent a good part of her life in Brazil. And here is writing about carnival, the dog as a pink dog, almost seems to be celebrating it, but again, more sardonicism, more of a sardonic tone. Here, the speaker is addressing a single dog, not dogs in the plural. Naked, you trot across the avenue. Oh, never have I seen a dog so bare, naked and pink, without a single hair. And so the dog is ironically celebrating carnival without any pink tutu. The dog is naturally. But of course, the dog is an outcast. And the dog is an outcast because the dog is stray. The dog has a case of scabies. The next stanza considers how the government treats beggars who are thrown into the water and what would they do with you? And she asked in the in this stanza here in the second column, if they do this to anyone who begs drugged, drunk or sober with or without legs, what would they do to sick four-legged dogs? They say carnival's degenerating in part because of you. A debilitated dog, depilated depil dog would not look so well. And so again, we see this sort of, um, this kind of heart-wrenching kind of poem, what happens to, um, what happens to dogs who do not sort of fit within the, um, within, you know, uh, standard U.S. life, all right? What, they are the ultimate others. The next poem is William Carlos Williams, great imagist. And if you know his poems, you may know him by his very famous poem, um, To a Red Wheelbarrow, So Much Depends Upon a Red Wheelbarrow, Glazed with Rain Water, um, Beside the White Chickens. In this case, So Much Depends Upon a Dog Injured in the Street. What depends on a dog injured in a street beauty? This is part of a much longer poem which is dedicated to Renee Shar, who is um, the addressee of the poem. Uh, Renee Shar, you are a poet who believes in the power of beauty to right all wrongs. And what is the wrong? This dying dog, this pathetic image of a dog on the street. Can beauty, what can beauty do in the face of this, of cruelty, of torture? Um, I too believe in the power of beauty. And it's, a, the dog becomes a kind of occasion for a poem about beauty. This next poem is focusing on the dog front and center by Angela Ball, Phantom Dog, about a dog who appears and then disappears. In this case, a dog is um, coming out, scavenging, ripping open a garbage bag, um, trying to get some food. The speaker says, here, uh, get away, get away. And then in the at the end of the first stanza says, here, girl, here, get your bone. She calls the dog back, but by this point in the second stanza, we see that the dog is gone. The speaker is left to reflect on this. There's the scene of bereftness and dogless quiet. What do we have here? Well, we have a breeze and it's aftermath. We have a breeze. There's the phantom lavishing the branches the tree fluent with green, even in January. And you can see here that dogs also satisfy a kind of scene setting role. And the next poem here, we have not just um, a dog 
perhaps near the point of death. Oh, and I also wanted to say that this dog has um, is a dog who has evidently just given birth to puppies. And I haven't I found a number of other dot poems about that, but no time for those. Here we have a dead dog featured. Donald Justice is known as kind of a poet's poet. And in um, in a little write up on this poem, he said he loves dogs dearly. And so not to think of him only in terms of his relationship with dead dogs. But in this scene, the uh, the title kind of provides the situation of the poem, the stray dog by the summer house. And so we have a dead dog lying um, the first half of the poem, and you can see this in the first column, there's a kind of gruesome image of worms crawling out of the dead dog's eye sockets. And the second half of the poem kind of shows out of that image of decay and death, we have a kind of beauty. And here we have the beauty described in terms of scent, which would be appropriate because scent are our dog's strongest, our dog's strongest um, uh, sense. And um, here we have a sense, uh, scent of a ripe round pear, so ripe, so round, dropped to the ground, much like the dog is on the ground. And you get the sense that the dog's corpse is kind of fertilizing the pear tree. And so out of this, out of death comes beauty. And again, more about the dog as an occasion to think about something else. In this next poem, um, we have here, a dog is also being used, a dead dog is being used as an occasion to think about something else. Um, and the poem is called A Metaphor Crosses the Road by Martha McFerrin. So a dog is actually turned into a metaphor for pure preparedness. In the situation of the poem, the speaker's friend, Janet, is terrified. One day she would swerve to miss a dog and demolish her car and kill her children. So that uh, in the next part of the poem, the next half, uh, in fact, she does hit the dog in the scenario that she had feared, and instead she hits the dog. And so the speaker reflects on this and bereaves it, mourns this situation. I cried real tears. Let's both watch out, dog. And you can see a kind of alignment between the, the speaker and the dog. And that alignment is very evident in this poem by Thomas McAfee, who is renowned as a realist poet from, from Alabama. And so here we have Frank the mongrel dog and I, clear connection between the dog and the self. We have mange together, I with my dandruff and flaking face, Frank with his thinning hair and sores, old wander, deer tramp and evil smelling, obvious connection, wagger of tail. He almost blesses me when I break out the canned horse meat. Talk about sacrifice. But I am Frank's defeat. The mange won't cure. And then we get this sudden line, I kill him. And then I am Frank's defeat. Well, who is my defeat to give me mercy I don't want. And so you have you can sort of see kill dogs to kill the mange, kill me to kill my dandruff. And so there's sort of sardonic, what do we make of this kind of poem? Um, and I know there's a lot more that can be said, but I'm going to move into the final part of my paper where I look at agency in this poem by Sandra Alden Armour, the dog, short, simple. You can see this refrain line, fence in the dogs, which is repeated six times. And so why do we fence in the dogs? They can't be brought to heel. They claim the land, they try to take over, they prowl, they sniff, they growl, they snap, they bare their teeth. And then she says, well, what do you do in the final stanza when they're unleashed? Well, unleash these dogs pursue their human lusts and she brings dogs to the plane of humans. They have their lusts, they have their needs, they have their desires. So I wonder why she doesn't say their dog lusts, but oh well. And in this final poem by a great American, the great, one of the great American beat poets, Lawrence Ferlinghetti, whose life spanned much of the 20th century and also part of the 21st, he just died last year. He was a very political poet. He believed that all art should be accessible or art should be accessible to all. And so we have this poem of jubilation, the dog trots freely in the street, single dog, free, trotting, doing what dogs do running. Um, one thing all dogs love to do, no matter where they live, they love to run. They're a running kind of creature. And so um, we see the dog trots freely in the street. This is These are just lines from a much longer poem. They think, they reflect, they have a real tale to tell, and then we've got punning, a real tale to tell it with. 
they're live, they're barking, they're democratic, they have something to say about being, about ontology, reality, how to see it, how to hear it, victorious answer, victorious capitalized to everything. They are the true poet, the true philosopher. So in conclusion, my conclusion is about 20 seconds. What can we say? Um, actually, why don't I leave with this tale? Both of these creatures are featured as not belonging in our modernist world. They are placeless, they are roving, they are vagrants. Weeds are often shown as hardy. Dogs, on the other hand, are shown as pathetic and vulnerable. Sometimes in these poems, they are shown as only part of the scene. Sometimes they are an occasion for something else or they are the entire focus. They are granted agency. They are also shown as being um, part of an entire ecology, a whole part of a whole ecosystem. Um, what we see these poets do so brilliantly and beautifully is capture their beings within this small space and in a world that is flooded with toxic Roundup, barricade, and other pesticides, and in which unhomed dog live lives of great precarity, one million are put down in the U.S. or killed in U.S. shelters alone every year. I believe that these poets enable readers to see these, these others, these weeds, these street dogs with new eyes. And that is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Let me stop the share screen and I will give the floor over. Thank you very much, Jeannie, for such an amazing presentation. <laughs> Lots of new poems to reread. Um, we can leave the questions for the end. Uh, we're going to move on now to our next speaker. Her name is Cristiana Pagliarusco and she comes from the Università Ca' Foscari. And her talk for today is titled Thinking and Talking Through Animals, Nicole Brown's Best Theory. Um, so whenever you're ready, Christiana, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dean. Lots of things to discuss, especially these last few lines uh, that you presented with Ferlinghetti, who is definitely one of my favorite. Uh, I come from a place here in, in Veneto region where Hemingway ruled the world, but the beat had at that time as well. So I'm very happy that you concluded with those lines and also with the statement that uh, you, uh, you somehow uh, take me to this presentation, probably uh, of a poet you might uh, know because she is from the Kentucky area. So the Appalachians are very close. Um, let me just open the presentation and the screen. I hope this is the right one because there are some other, yeah, should be there. Can you see it? Thank you. So yes, yeah, so thinking and talking through animals and Nicole Brown's base theory. Uh, let's see if I can move on. Right, okay. Uh, let's say that two lines uh, trigger, have triggered this talk about uh, uh, Nicole Brown's poetry, a contemporary uh, poem from the Kentucky area. And uh, the first is definitely the title of a chat book uh, she published in 2018, the title is to those who were our first gods. And there's something more uh, that trigger that uh, the talk I'm, I'm presenting today. And it is exactly these two lines. Am I not an animal too? If so, Lord, make me one again, which is taken from the poem, A Prayer to Talk to Animals. Uh, there's a very long list of uh, titles of poems that uh, authenticate Brown's attention for investigating the concerned relationship between human, and we will be talking about non-human animals, uh, which translate the true nature of the author within and outside uh, her book pages. Um, from the very early stage of her career as a poet uh, back in 2007, the title The Smell of Snake uh, Collection, to when uh, Adam ate from the tree of knowledge, the animals ate from it to 2009. And also in the forthcoming anthology about Eve, um, and going through other poems such as Self Portrait as Eastern Wood Rat 
Brown has always been valuing a long project of a pastry of all sorts uh, that focuses on the experience of creatures in a world human shaped and are destroyed nowadays. Her lyrics are unconventional uh, and they propose an original perspective. I, I copy the link to the poem in the chat box. Um, yes, yeah, so they are originals, uh, they give original perspectives and they are far from the detached audio outlooks of a few privileged people who were mainly concentrated on pastoral narrations enjoyed from their comfortable grounds and highbrow education. Uh, the poem, uh, the poems by Brown pierce the reader's body straightforwardly. Uh, they work like a garden tool through the southern trash talking language they speak. And I was speaking about the barons uh, Jen was, uh, was mentioning before, the outcast the protagonist and these uh, voiceless voices of animals that we read before. Um, so they come very, very straightforward, like this garden tool. And as reported on her biography on our website, and by reading, reading the critical reviews Brown has received, her Kentucky upbringing and her working class belonging long made her, and I quote, feel shut out of nature and the writing about it, end of quote. Brown slowly managed to handle such an ease of feeling, an ease feeling and she has embraced so far a vibrant view through which she helps her readers support the anthropological discourse that takes its distance from the traditionally binary opposite relation humans versus animals. Then after reading some of these poems uh, I came up with a question and I asked, my and I asked myself how does she help me us rediscover this relation in corresponding terms rather than in opposing ones. First of all, the language she embraces reclaims the instinctive, inbred, the natural versus the cultural character embodied by inborn speech, where the voice rings with ains and dams and where words suitably said by Elizabeth Bradfield remind of deep biblical rhythms, a jargon that was sung through the appellation as in the line that I propose here, if you will, Lord, make me the teeth hot in the mouth of a raccoon scrape in the junk I scraped from last night's plate. The Unearthing of this connection from the ground, from the very basis, from the root of our upbringing, dismantles more than one paradigm and confirms the fact that Brown, here I quote from, uh, from a critical review, is tearing down the here for our use capitalistic and patriarchal relationship to animals, humanity has used since time immemorial, end of quote. Has she writing a long poem about the biblical Samson? There is a better way to solve this. And the answer is no longer fear, curdling to rage, a murdered lion with a sworn sugar in his remains. If we follow her discourse, we could do better by being animals, non-humans, and we just might save ourselves too. The uh, protracted standpoint uh, that, that humans are, while animals are, highlighting the contrastive tones of the statement is completely and figuratively pulled to pieces by the way Nicole Brown decides to kneel down and listen to the non-humans and to her own nature, showing us the possibility to be a wholeness. She tells us stories and by telling us stories often drawn from her own direct experiences with non-humans while she offers 
every day a service as a rescuer and helper in several animal sanctuaries, Brown traces back the history of our relation with those who were our first gods at the beginning of time. She goes beyond the mere explanation or exploration of the links between human beings and animal beings. But she longs for becoming the human animal. She feels the urgency to return. It's a strong effort. It is a strong effort. We were speaking about agency before. It is a strong effort to rediscover the agentic capacity that bring her individual transformation. Her lyrical poetry instills fields of energetic social cognitive theory that validate her personal journey and that of those who are looking for changes like me. And by observing the non-human and the environment that surrounds them and by which she is surrounded, Brown takes that Wordsworthian leap of imagination through which she does not only try to reconnect to the non to the non-human animals, but she prays for embodying their agentic capacity, hoping to regain and help them regain their roles on Earth. The otherworldly dimension of the prayer through which the poem is built uh, projects her lyrical voice, and those who listen to it into a fantastic world, dominated by paws and crooked uh, blue dark eyes. As in the words of the scholar Stephanie Bird's volume, Don't Read Poetry, the harder a poet works to give a personality to a non-human speaker, a talking seagull, a feather fan from a native ceremony, a door knob, the more you might think that you are reading a portrait of a particular kind of a human being, end of quote. Brown's poem, A Prayer to Talk to Animals, Praise the Lord, which is another link uh, that I would like to discuss uh, with Jean after the, the talk. Um, it's uh, a pantheistic God that sees all. And uh, this Lord is trying, or better, the, the the poem by uh, Nicole tries to reconvert her lyrical eye into its original shape and identity, which is that of the former animal she used to be. Am I not an animal too? If so, Lord, make me one again. She longs for recuperating the lost power of her dirty claws and blood warm horns. She begs the Lord to help her get rid of her alien self, who is, quote, too selfish, even look up from the black over damn phone. Following their dogmatic rules for asking and receiving forgiveness after having become too human, busy clicking what I like, busy pushing my cuticles back and back, brown unearths and voices a natural queer non-binary sense of her existence. She makes peace and she asks us make peace with the world finally seen through her regain blue eye of that young crow that one cocked to her. Brown already revealed the strange feeling of having lost her, our connection to the natural world when she wrote to those who were our first gods, reminding her repulsion towards those men like him Samson, who slit the throats of lamb, then struck a pipe to burn the poor beast, calling what they have done a sacrifice. In the attempt to rise a tribe over the other, to rise a species all, all over the other, by killing innocent and non-humans, Brown represents the human desire to extend such power and capacity over any other species or race. And by using these uh, biblical references to Samson's in the book of Judges in the Old Testament, she examines the brutality of predation and the superiority that humans have inflicted against the soft and liquid cathedral of the animal's body just to mimic their godlike supremacy. The perpetration of such rule, which is started on these uh, sacrif sacrificial pyres in ancient times, has brought 
humans to justify any form of justice or cruelty against non-humans, and I add, and humans, to the point of accepting the most unhuman behaviors against and not in favor non-humans. Aware of this estrangement due, the, due to the hyper connection with everything and everyone read a control here, the humans have become incapable of deeper feelings and have lost their inbuilt guides. So they have allowed generalization, simplification, and they have accepted the common attitude to superficiality, fragmentation seduction of external appearance and liking consumerism, forbidding themselves the capacity to self-efficacy and self-acceptance. It is by persisting in such behavior that they have excluded themselves from a closer relation between body and mind, unfortunately wasting the ability to feel profoundly. Um, what impressed me in Brown's poetry is this uh, capacity of uh, making the concept of a new materialism in a lyrical way, in an, in a, in an original way, uh, therefore opposing the idea that a linguistic and poetic turn might compromise the function of this discourse. On the contrary, uh, the poet's language objectifies, and I was thinking about uh, William Carlos Williams uh, before, and materializes a desire to contrast a world that is undergoing a process of uh, emotional dematerialization and decorporization, decorporation, borrowing a natural science uh, term, which is commonly called the liquid light. Now, here recalling the liquid crystals displays of TV sets and smartphones Brown uses to measure her separation from her former self. It would be restrictive to call Brown a Nico poet. Uh, she rejects any language that might become all but incomprehensible, distorting in concert with a ravaged world. She's not only a nature poet who might reflect on the world as being a distance, an exceptionalized place of awe and exceptional untouchability, as in the words of Sophie Clark. I came up with the idea of calling Nicole an echo poet, uh, since her lyrical eye invites me to hear before listening and to question myself. And for doing so, she uses, uh, I quote, a porch, stoop and diner and parking lot colloquial language, uh, says Sophie Clark. A kind of poetry that does not risk losing the reader's attention or identification by employing unconventional language or form. And I'm coming to my conclusion, there is much at stake in these poems to risk not speaking simply. And uh, therefore the poems, once you have the opportunity to read some of them, stand out shouting, singing from the center of this history of progressing ignorance, this deeply ingrained system of, cru of cruelty. The echoing voice is that of a queer woman, a marginalized voice that uh, both sings uh, her own natural history and begs uh, for animals uh, to speak can understand. So the first question she seems to invite us uh, to ask ourselves is about uh, the Lord, that Lord that the poetic voice addresses. If you go to the poet, to the poem which I uh, uh, linked in the chat box, you understand uh, this uh, uh, addressed uh, uh, Lord. She uh, tried to depict it. Is this Lord the one she used to pray? taught by her illiterate grandmother, Franny, who misspelled her name in her birth certificate the day she was born from a 16-year-old single mom in Southern Kentucky? Or is it the same Lord who humans taught it asked for non-human and human sacrifices? Is it the same Lord who condemns lesbians and gays and sinners and sick? And why is she praying 
such a controversial figure who tells uh, her she's mostly wrong, starting from the unnecessary K in her name? Is she teasing the reader? Is she by any chance telling that uh, everything is a mistake, that the way we are seeing the world is but a capsized reverse order of the sense of things? Maybe Nicole is warning us that what scholars call with big names and new materialism, new poverty, nowadays defined as a condition of psychic poverty, a pathological syndrome that elevates the subjects who suffer from it to social acclamation and success instead of highlighting their superficiality is but, allow me, what if Equin, Adrian's rich, powerful, Incipit. What if we discover that our misery comes from the awareness that we have lost the capacity to put ourselves in someone else's shoes? Normally more tight fitting, less comfortable, broken. Discover that among us there are creatures who crawl to be helped and fed once we have deprived them of the soil they were nourished by. Maybe by coming into close contact with hunger, pain, dirt, hence by becoming, returning, looking back to the origin of our animal species and be treated as we treat those who were considered, who we now consider inferior to us, maybe again, we can finally understand what we are doing to this place we inhabit. Nicole's poetry, and really concluding, function as a Nico for the voiceless. She might even miss her paws and eyes, but she still has a voice and she has made it clear she wants to use it. Jerry Bates quotes Milan Kundera's work. Humanity's true moral test, its fundamental test, consists of its attitude towards those who are at its mercy. Another concept Jam came out with before. Um, and animals. And in this respect, the humankind has a suffered a fundamental debacle, a debacle so fundamental that all others stem from it. Nicole Brown's poetry lives these words. And uh, as though the whole word is a soon of teeth and tongue and sound from the animal kingdom, each poem in this collection has a voice. And it is sometimes with a deadly accuracy that we hear this boomerang, a humankind's confusion and jealousy of sharing, caring about our fellow beings and indeed the earth itself. Mercy is the word to begin again. But in my opinion, it is not only a matter of mercy, but it's rather a matter of language. And as Nicole claims here at the end of her poem, Fork my tongue, Lord. There is a sorrow on the air I taste but cannot name. I want to open my mouth and know the exact flavor of what's to come. I want to open my mouth and sound the language that calls our old language home. This common language sounds clearly like a provocation to defy the anthropocentric structure of the world. Aren't we all inhabiting the same place? Maybe this is the daring prayer Nicole is tackling to the Lord, the human made Lord, who seems to have forgotten the rest of its creatures. Thank you. Let me close. Thank you, very much. Thank you very much, Christiana, for such an inspiring presentation. It's, it's, uh, it's, um, it's something I, I'm working on. So there, there are lots of things uh, that uh, obviously can be said about uh, these uh, incredible figures she uh, uh, devised and uh, she created this uh, strange lord. Uh, but uh, I haven't had uh, much time uh, in the past a few weeks uh, to uh, go deeper into a clearer uh, definition. I hope. Uh, the presentation was quite clear. Yeah, it, I, I, it was. It was. It's a very original figure, I think. I always, yeah, fascinated. But I, I haven't even know this author. So, so yeah, it's like really, um, 
I became curious. <laughs> um, so we've got 10 minutes now for the Q&A session. So um, is there any question from the audience to our speakers? I also believe that, um, Christiana, you wanted to discuss something with... Uh, yes, if, if, I, if I can. Yeah, yes, of course. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. Uh, in Italy, pesticides are forbidden. Um, we, uh, we had a very, very hot summer here in Italy and throughout Europe, uh, the world. And uh, therefore this heat killed most of the vegetation around us. Um, Things are changing these days as some storms uh, have come and uh, some weeds uh, are cracking uh, in the streets. But we are somehow forbidden to use any uh, pesticide to get rid of them. So we definitely have to remove them with our hands. You were speaking about uh, this resistance, this uh, willingness uh, to survive. Uh, we have always given a bad connotation, a bad name to weeds. And I'm always uh, thinking about uh, Nicolas Bourriot's theory about uh, the radicans. I'm thinking about uh, uh, Deleuze and Gattari thousand planes and their rhizomatic theory. I've always had the idea that weeds are an example rather than a faulted, this is my dog, <laughs> something wrong in the world. Why do we keep extirpating them? Why do we keep this idea of resisting their resistance. Like a dog, sometimes if they think about uh, Edgar Allan Poe and the, the black cat and my dog that is always looking for me, especially when I do not need him to be around. What is so weird about it? such a strong resistance in weeds and stray dogs? Christiana, thank you so much for your question. But first of all, let me just thank you for a really beautiful paper. I was taking notes the entire time and I, I'm going to buy that volume of Nicole Brown's poetry. I teach a class called Animal Planet. So I she thank will you love the bottom it. of my she heart. Will love it. She's a you fantastic were, you were, woman. You are so clear. I, that was so wonderful and focused. Mine was such a survey and you were really you know, it was just a, such a pleasure and even the way you delivered it, but about weeds. So I, I actually came to weeds through stray dogs and a friend of mine was organizing a conference on plants and I'd never written on plants. And I teach a course called Global Infrastructures and weeds keep coming up um, hmm. at the different resonances, but this is not a literature class because I teach in global studies, even though I'm a professor of literature, but I primarily teach non-literary classes. So anyway, naturally, because I'm in, my heart is in literature, I got, I, I thought, well, what about the poetic representation of weeds? Because certainly there are a lot of poems about dogs. So I actually went to the web and I looked up weed poems. And then I went to this conference and I learned that um, this was in Turkey at um, Cappadocia University. And there is a whole body of literature and scholarship on, on weeds. And, and I really, um, I, I want to um, explore, explore this in more detail. So anyway, I just want to say poets get it, right? But my, my country, <laughs> my country, um, yeah, I mean, we're so militaristic, aren't we? I mean, we have what, 800 plus military bases. I think we kind of not only declare a war on the world, we're known, um, self-declared as the world's policeman, but I think that we can't stand, um, think about Mary Douglas, dirt is matter out of place. Yeah. I think it's part of modernism and keeping things in its place. Like other countries have street dogs. We don't have them anymore. We throw them, except in certain communities, um, particularly in the US South. Um, we have to keep things in their place. And there's a whole industry as well. I mean, there's 
I mean, even this morning when I was walking my dogs, by the way, they're they're lying right here. Um, I yeah. them. thought I'd show them to you. Um, I saw a pest. <laughs> oh, thank you for that. I, I saw a pesticide truck and where I live, my landlord has um, ant traps all over. And of course, ants are perfectly harmless. They're good creatures. Um, and so I think that people are just it's part of consumerism, militarism. And it's part of this country's ethos and it's it's a real uphill struggle. I mean, I talk with my university about their use of Roundup. I talk with the university up in New Haven where I also live, I, uh, my house abuts Yale University's property where they routinely use it. And it's really hard to even get the academic industrial complex to start using it. So um, rah, rah rah for the poets because because they really, uh, especially Nicole Brown, who wanted us to kind of think about living in correspondence and not um, in this antagonistic kind of relationship. So, so yeah, I, I'm deeply concerned. And it has a lot to do too with history and well, um, chemical weapons were used during World War II. And then these manufacturers said, oh, what can we use these chemicals for? And so, you know, we start this use against weeds. And of course they're used in warfare. I mean, look at the US military and Agent Orange and, um, you know, exfoliating one tenth of all of uh, Vietnam and, um, you know, the horrible cancers that people are still living with. So, so anyway, I'm, I'm saying this is where it comes from. And I wish that we learn from Italy and other countries. Great Britain it does not have a great record either, by the way. I've yeah. seen a lot of Roundup being yeah. used. Yeah. Yes. So that's probably uh, too long of an answer, but yeah. Ireland is behaving differently, definitely. Uh, there, there's another policy, there's another uh, approach to uh, the uh, conservation of this, uh, let me say, wilderness, but also uh, primi primitiveness, some sort of, uh, in which we feel a sense of uh, belonging, uh, that instead we are trying to remove, so we are removing ourselves from the world uh, together with all the, the things that we want exactly, as you said before, destroy uh, under the name of a uh, human order, not a natural order. Thank you uh, very Sorry. much. Yeah, I take I take some solace in a column that uh, Rebecca Solnit just wrote for the Guardian on kind of you know let's not let's not um, disregard small steps. And so there are some small steps like no mow May. Let's not mow our lawns in May. And I know that there are a lot of activists on the local level. Like if we if we have um, a war against weeds, we also have a lot of leaf blowers in the U.S. The US is a very, very noisy country. You can't really go anywhere without hearing leaf blowers. And so there are some attempts to kind of regulate these things, but yeah, it's it's unfortunate. And of course you can see part of my part of my life is spent kind of resisting these things that that the poets are also resisting. Sorry, I was saying just uh, thanking you for such an interesting um, discussion. I wish we could uh, continue forever. Uh, I just wanted to ask uh, before um, leaving if there's any last minute question from the audience. I think they're quite quiet now today. Um, well, unfortunately we've run out of time. So there were a few questions that I had in mind but they were also answered in the discussion because I was thinking, um, can any of his poems be talking about something else rather than animals, which is important enough, weeds, which is important enough, but also something deeper in the American ethos? Um, because, uh, well, obviously, um, Jeannie's title is quite political, the war on, and it makes me think of the war on terror, the war on drugs. Um, but anyway, you feel very well talking of like this kind of militarized uh, mindset in the United States that can be extended to so many topics. Um, if you wish to continue discussing, we, um, the organizers have habilitated a room named Launch A, uh, if you want to continue this question. Uh, but now at um, six o'clock um, Central European time, summertime, uh, we've got the round table title, let me see, um, Games and Digital Spaces, if you want to join that. Um, 
And if not, we continue, we will continue with this conference tomorrow and on Friday. So let me give a virtual clap to our wonderful two speakers. And I'd just like to say that it's been a pleasure to host this panel and uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day.